This is an interview that Gordon Higginson did with Jean Bassett in approximately 1989 at Stansted Hall. It runs for one hour and four minutes. This interview formed the basis of the chapter on Gordon Higginson in Jean's book, 100 Years of National Spiritualism. The book was published in 1990 and looks at the history and first 100 years of the Spiritualist National Union, of which Gordon was the president. In the interview, Gordon discusses the fascinating story of how he became president and went on to save the Union and the Arthur Finley College for future generations. He also talks about his early life, his wartime experiences, his work as a demonstrating medium, plus the development of his physical mediumship. This is one of the best interviews about Gordon himself and is of significant historical importance. It was recorded on a handheld tape recorder, so the quality is not that of a professional recording, and there is some handling noise. Nonetheless, it is of good quality and is well worth a listen, as it gives us great insight into Gordon and the legacy he created. I do hope you enjoy it. In, in reference to his 20 years, it'll be 20 years next year, won't it? 20 years as president of the Spiritualist National Union. First of all, Gordon, when did you come into the union itself? I've always been in the union. Um, I couldn't be a member at one time until uh, I was 18 years of age. But I was a member of the Lycea and had been since I was about four or five years of age. Really? Which so Lyceum was that? This was the Longford Lyceum. And um, so it was automatic that I was always a member. So that from being a Lyceumist and a member of the Lyceum, I then became a member of the church. And from being a member of the church, I then became a member of the um, of the Spiritualist of Union. Yeah. So I would say that I was a member from when I was about 18. Good. Having said that, um, was your mother a member of the Union? Yes, yeah, she was always a member of the Union um, from when she was very young because she always belonged to the church, which is a Union church. Yes. And uh, so she was uh, always a member uh, of the Union, yes. I understand that she was a great medium herself. I probably always thought that um, um, she was one of the greatest mediums, um, not because she was my mother, because I know that the great love that people had for her, she was a very popular medium. And I think for any person to belong to one church, which she had done for 70 years, and been a medium for 70 years there, um, ever since she was 18, she was a medium there. And to know that she could pack the church at any time all those years um, tells you that there was not only a great love, but people had a great respect. And I think it was the respect of knowing that uh, she was good, mm -hmm. uh, that I'd always felt that she was uh, one of the um, really outstanding mediums. That people, even though she's been passed away now over 10 years, uh, oh, well over 10 years, nearly 13 or 14 years, um, people still send flowers on her birthday to the really? church. And still on the, on the day of her passing. Good Lord. That is amazing. They remember me even to now. That, that is amazing. Later. No, that is so And even amazing. one lady in a church away, at, um, away from ours, which is uh, 50 miles away, in the church on the birthday, she always sends a beautiful bouquet of red roses. Nice. And if they, they go in this church and they're put on for the memory of Mrs. Higgins. Lovely. And you they had a very close earth. relationship with Tremendous her. Tremendously close. Things. She was a very, she was not only an excellent medium, but she was a, a very friendly woman. She was, um, people respected her and uh, she never ever turned anyone away. That was uh, her a feature about her, that um, People felt that she was like their mother, mm -hmm. and she could go. To, they could go to her, and she would never turn them away. She would always speak to them. Was your father mediumistic? <coughs> I don't think he was. Uh, my mother always said that he was. Um, he could have been a better medium than herself. I would doubt that, of course. But, yes. Um, he never really uh, had a great deal to it. 
I suppose if I was to say what my father was, I would say that he was a reincarnationist because he believed in reincarnation because he'd had experiences that he felt that reincarnation to him was a fact. Mm -hmm. uh, and although um, he accepted spiritualism and uh, uh, he would defend it, he was not an, an attender mm -hmm. of the church. And what did he do for a living? Well, my father was uh, was um, in China. That's you know uh, China where. Yes. And uh, he was one of the very special <coughs> people that um, made the specialized teapots. Really. And he was a teapot maker. Yes. Oh. And uh, some of the very oh the teapots that my father made. When he passed away, the um, the managing director who came to my father's funeral said that he considered that he was the finest um, teapot maker in the country. Oh, that's and uh, that they, uh, years later when I met them, um, they told me uh, that um, uh, they'd never ever been able to replace my father for his wonderful work. He was a real craftsman and he loved his work and he came out mm -hmm. in what he produced. And he obviously loved people because that yes. passed on from both sides of oh, the family. Oh, that's right, yes. yes. Right. Now then, you became um, a member of the church when you were 18. How long was it before you uh, became interested in uh, district uh, work and national work? I don't think really that I was ever um, interested in um, district work. Um, I used to attend. I couldn't say that I was particularly interested. Mm -hmm. um, I attended, uh, I attended all the meetings, but I also, if they asked me, which I always did, any of their large meetings, I was always invited. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wasn't sure at that time that I, that I liked um, sort of administrative work. I yes. felt as a medium that um, I could do my work better as a medium than I could as, a, as an administrator. Mm -hmm. And it was not until um, uh, Really, I suppose, although I was a class B and attended the annual meetings, um, until um, the union was going through a very difficult period, and people said to me, why don't you put up? And I said, no. And then ultimately I did, after thinking about it seriously. And I became the um, class B representative um, on the old union, that was the before With the council, the system, yes, and uh, the national council, and um, that was the first. And I'd never held a position in the district level, never, but I did at the national level. But what year was that? Any idea? I can't remember offhand, but right. I would certainly records. say that um, it must be um, at least the very least. Um, 30 years ago, really? I would say at the moment that I am the longest serving member of the um, district council as well as being the longest serving president. And today, I think Wilfred Watts will be the only other member that's been on as long as uh, follows me. But I've done all those years, at least 30 years service, non-stop consecutive years as a member of the old National Council and the new one. On consecutive years? Yes. You've never, never been on? Never, ever been on. Really? Never voted on. You were a B-class member, in fact, until you became the president, were you not? I was a class, uh, class B member. Uh, sorry, the bar, class B representative. Yes, yes. I was um, a class B representative until um, I was um, invited to be the... Um, um, vice President, and uh, I served several years, and then I was approached to stand for Vice President, and I was a Vice President for two, I think three years, and then I, um, I became the President. In 1970. Mm. Yes. It's wonderful. I understand that you became the President as a result, direct result of spirit influence. Yes. Yes, that's quite Would you like great. to tell that story for us? Mm. Um, I didn't want to be the um, president of the um, uh, 
Union at all. I was interested in Stansford Hall. And uh, I felt that uh, Stansford Hall had so much to offer and that the Union, uh, to my way, is the finest um, spiritualist organization in the world. And I believe that uh, it was brought about by spirit. And when Stansford Hall came, I felt the spirit were manifesting their powers because they wanted to work through the union as the unifying body mm -hmm. to bring um, all the religions together. Yes. That's what I felt. Yes. And so, although I was invited uh, uh, and nominated to be the president, I wasn't happy about it. And so I turned it down and said no. I didn't want it. And I happened to go to Portsmouth uh, Temple, uh, which is a very fine church. And I went uh, in those days two or three times a year to take one service, which was usually on Saturday. Mm. And I, this um, uh, happened, and it happened to be the year, uh, the year, uh, early in the year of 1970. Um, so uh, I turned it down and I'd gone to the state of service and I was returning home, which I always did, after service, traveling through the night uh, to get back home. Yes. And I found myself coming along and I made a wrong turn somewhere and was heading towards Stancer's Hall and realized that I'd lost my way and um, had come off the path, come off the road. So um, I was uh, stopped and I decided to telephone um, the management here, which happened to be Mr. Sills. And uh, I said to him, could you possibly um, put me up for the night? I feel terribly tired, I've gone off the road. And um, for some reason, I'm falling asleep. And I, if you could put me up, I'd be very grateful. And he said, there's only you here, because the hall was closed for the winter months. And he said, by all means, do come and we'll look after you. I said, I will have to leave first thing in the morning. So I arrived here. He stayed up for me. It was two or three o'clock in the morning before I got here. And uh, he uh, had my room warm and uh, I got a lovely sort of sandwiches and everything for me. And really looked up. And then he said, that I should go and have a sleep and come back, when, come down to your breakfast when you're ready. Which I did. I came down, and when I came down, uh, he said to me, he said, uh, um, there's a gentleman waiting to see you. And so I said, but nobody knows I'm here. I'm supposed to be at home. So he said, well, he says you know that he's here. So I said, well, I don't. And I said, I think you'd better get rid of him because I really can't stay. I've got to uh, go back home. And um, so he said, well, I think you ought to see him. He didn't say anything other than that. So I had my breakfast and um, I went to, uh, to the library where I was told this man was. And when I walked into the room, I discovered that there was um, a monk there, dressed in the monks habit with a rope and, sh and uh, sandals on, no spots on. And he had a beard and his hair was um, uh, cut uh, short. And um, I said, oh, excuse me. Um, and I walked out. And I thought, this is wrong because I didn't do anything wrong. So I went to Mr. Silver's and I said, there's nobody there to see me except Mark. I don't know who he's waiting for. He says, he's the man that wants to see you. So I went in and said, I believe you want to see me. And he said, yes. Did you know uh, that I was going to be here? I said, no, I didn't. And so I said, I should be home. He said, well, how do you think you got here? And so I said, well, as far as I know, I must have fallen asleep. It was not, uh, my attention was not on the road. And um, I think I just came off the road. So he said, um, well, I have a message for you. 
And I was taken back because I hadn't asked him his name and he hadn't mentioned his name to me. And Mr. Sills certainly hadn't said he was. And I said, a message from you? So he said, yes. He said, I believe uh, and I'm told that I have to pass a message on to you. I didn't ask him where he had come from and anything about it, but I thought this man must be mad. And so he said, you have a work to do. I hope you're aware of that. I said, well, I think I work very hard for the socialist movement. And uh, he said, but you have a much greater work to do. And um, it is important that you don't uh, say no to the position that's been offered to you. And I said, the only position that's been offered to me is the position of president. And I wouldn't touch it with a bar to I said, I don't mind working for the union. I've always done that all my life. And I don't mind working for Stanford Hall because I love it. And I think it's a wonderful place. I said, but if you're asking me to take the responsibility, then the answer is definitely no. Because I have a very good job. I, am, I can devote my life to spiritualism freely because I'm paid well. And uh, I'm not in need of money. I can get by, and I'd rather do it as I want to. So he said, I'm, the message that I have for you is that you must, uh, you must change your mind and um, uh, take the position that's been offered to you. You are needed. Those are the words he said. Yes. I came up to Mr. Sills and I said, this man is crazy. I said, there's someone, he can't possibly be a monk. I said, there's someone that's acting the simple, it's foolish, it's stupid. Did he ever give his name? No, uh, never gave his name. Uh, so I, he said, what he said, so I told him, and he said, I'll come in with you. And we came through the door, and the man had disappeared. Now, no one can get out of, from mm -hmm. the library there only one way, that's right. and that's through the door. And uh, we both stood in the gallery. If he'd come out, we'd have seen him, and uh, said to me, you must contact a carriage in Manchester and tell him that you'll stand for the position. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mr. Sills, I can't. I said, honestly, I can't. I said, I, I have a very important job. I told my mother about it. She wasn't very happy that I would uh, sort of uh, do it because she always thought that uh, my job was at a medium mm -hmm. and not as an administrator. And I'm sorry. The hottest seat. Yes. Still is. Because the union was in a uh, terrific financial mess. And the union was losing things all over the place, losing members. It was... Uh, it was got owed thousands and thousands of pounds. And the people at that time had known exactly what our debts were. I do honestly think that um, they would have, um, they, there would have been an infernal row, and I think everyone would have been thrown out of the union, and I really think it would have folded up. That's mm -hmm. what I honestly think. How did and it I get think into such else debt, Gordon? Sorry? How did it get into such debt? Well, I think... Forgive me for saying, but I, I don't want to appear to be unkind to people in the past. I think it was badly managed, mm -hmm. and uh, I think the secretary did a wonderful job, I mean, Dick Elliott, but I don't think he got the support that he should have done. And I don't think that, um, and I mean this in the nicest way, I don't think the presidents of the union moved among the people enough. I think that they were a name. They were a figurehead, but they didn't move with the people. Yeah. And so I, from this experience, decided to stand for president, and I went in unopposed. And uh, I stood up at the Bur Buxton Conference, because that's where I was, and I said, if I cannot change the financial situation or do some, improve the union situation in three years, I shall um, stand down from this position. And I think, really, that it would be wise to do so, because it's so serious that I believe that someone's got to do something. And 
were halved. And so I, with the vice president, who then was Derek Everett, uh, worked very hard indeed. Uh, we owed, at one period, £40,000 to the bank. And 20 years ago, that was a lot of money. They closed our accounts so they would lend us no more money. And not one of the checks was on it. It was out. Yeah. So it was that situation. And so I went around the country collecting money, taking services, collecting money. I As had, donations? Yes, or I yes. had a campaign which um, I put up. And at this point, I would like to say that Morris Barbonell, who is now um, passed, was turned out to be my greatest friend. Really? And Harry Edwards yes. uh, became my greatest friend. Between them, they stood by me and they fought alongside me. Mm -hmm. And they helped. Harry Edwards took services for me. He charged not a penny expenses. In fact, he gave money. Really? Us. Yes. And so did Barbadale. Really? In the meetings that I, that I put on for Barbonell, he never charged one penny expense. And very often, I would put money in the union's way. Um, Maurice Barbonell, he was, uh, was he a, a national spiritualist? Yes, he was a was. member. Yes, yes, always a member. And um, uh, he, well, as I say, he gave us the publicity, he helped us, and uh, worked in the background. He never ever put himself forward and said, I've done this and I've done that. Mm. Quietly did it. Mm -hmm. And so did Harry Edwards. Wonderful. And they supported me tremendously. And uh, within three years, we had not paid back, but we had been able uh, to pay back certain monies that had been loaned to the union free of interest, mm -hmm. to pay that back. And we eventually paid all the debts. But the large debt that was hanging over us, of course, was stamped at all. Yes. Uh, and eventually I stood by it. And although I wanted to give the job up many times, and most people didn't want the job because the financial message was in. Mm -hmm. and so I stood by it through all, through everything. And eventually we cleared all our, mm. our debts. And did you find that uh, the position of pre president and the administration interfered with your work as a medium? I think, and I must say that, although I've spoken of Bob and Earl and, um, and Harry Edwards, I feel always uh, that I felt that they'd given me a lot of support and um, they were prepared to work free of charge mm -hmm. and support. But I must say that there were many people that ran it. Yes. And the one thing about the union, of which I will always admire the union, is that the people, when our backs of the wall, fight. That's true. And I can't remember how many people offered their services. There was, so, you see, the trouble was that no president had had the courage to tell the people how difficult the situation was, and I did. Mm -hmm. And I felt that if I went down, I expected the people to go down. Yeah. And I felt that it was those moments, in those early years, those first three years, of where we found really the friends of the Union yeah. and the churches that stood by us. Mm. Um, when did you first, who was it that first uh, thought of changing the um, makeup of the union from the council, which was top heavy, to the three tier system? Well, this was brought about years before because you see, the union, the administration of the union was in such an appalling way that work from one year to another was practically never done. We had the, the council was much too wheelie, wheelie, wheelie. It was um, one of those sort of council that was much too big. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't get through the work. Oh. 
And we used to have a whole weekend from Friday right through until Monday, and could never get through the work at all, uh, because it was so, it was so unwieldy. It was, it was just not manageable. Yeah. And so the, there was always complaints every year that letters had not been answered, that things that should have been done were not done. Um, and they were quite right to do so. It was an appalling state. And I was overworked, underpaid. Yeah. The general secretary was... Which, um, which was... The, um, um, Dick Elliott. Dick Elliott. Uh, oh, yeah. He was an ex. He was still the secretary. But he, he, yeah. You see, he hadn't enough staff to deal with yeah. it. Yeah. And um, then, you see, uh, this came up. We had um, a committee to look into the this, this situation. It took us two or three years to mm -hmm. get the work done. I was chosen as a member of that particular committee, along with four more. And we came out with, yeah. uh, came forward with a, um, a sort of recommendations of how we could change it. Yeah. And no, that was how yeah. the three tier system was born. Can you remember who the other members of the committee were? Um, Harold Vigers was one, Laurie Wilson was the other, uh, Ainley was the other, and uh, Wilfred Watts was the other. Lovely. Okay. Those were the five. And it was 75, I think, wasn't it, I when the three-tier system came in? No, what, um, what happened was it was before 1975, for the first committee, because I came off that committee uh, when I became president. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it went on then uh, with, I can't remember the person who replaced me, I don't think they probably did have a replacement, mm -hmm. but they carried on with that uh, particular committee. They brought it forward, it was shelved, and then I decided it was time something was done about it. Mm -hmm. And so I asked um, the members that it was time that we really had uh, uh, streamlined the whole of the Union, and that's how it came about. So it would be in 1975 when the actual streamlining began, mm -hmm. and that the three-tier system was brought about. And I believe that it was the correct thing to do. Oh, I, I, I agree. You know, I, which was very important, was that I, in, I brought forward the recommendation that the offices of the union, which were then in Manchester, should be brought to Stansted. Did you? Yes. So that the um, we didn't have to keep going to Manchester and then <coughs> to Stansted, which I felt was wrong to have two administrations mm -hmm. so far apart. And um, so we came here and took over the annex. And um, again, uh, I think that was absolutely correct mm -hmm. because then we had the whole of the administration together yeah. and it was much easier for us who were coming because we had somewhere to stay the night mm -hmm. and do the work if we had to do it. And um, also that if we needed anything in the um, uh, uh, at the council to do with anything, everything was together. Yeah. When you say uh, that you had two administration centres, one in Manchester and one at Stansted, mm -hmm. um, what administration centre had you at Stansted at that time? Well, it was of course the hall, which was very important, yes. uh, because that was where our main debt was. was yes. Here. And it was draining all our reserves uh, of the Union. And therefore, um, a great deal of uh, things were here going on. We had to be here far more than what we were at Manchester. Mm -hmm. And uh, to sort of have the responsibility of here and of Manchester was yes. too much for us. Yes. And then you see what happened was that fire precautions came in at that time. And uh, we were ordered uh, by the, um, the fire proportions that we had to have a staircase put in and all sorts of things at Manchester, and we could not afford it. Mm -hmm. And so it was decided, because of that, to bring the administration here and uh, have everything here. Yeah. Did time. you own, your, own the offices at Manchester? Yes, we did, and they were sold, and the money, of course, yeah. um, Where was, was that? put to the union. Where was it in Manchester? In Tiblaine. Tiblaine. 
Right. Now, uh, you left school at what age? I left school when I was 14 to go to a commercial school yes. uh, until I was 15. And then from there, I, um, I went to um, the Wolverhampton um, um, Technical College until I was um, 16. What were you studying? I was studying um, uh, advertising. I was very fond of window dressing, mm -hmm. and I was very fond of publicity. And, um, of course, it helped me because uh, I was in the shoe trade. Yes. And, um, and it was rather strange that my uh, uncle was in the shoe trade. He was a sh um, uh, shoe men, uh, repairer and maker. And my grandfather was a shoemaker. Yeah. And um, I'm told by my family and that even my great-grandfather was a shoemaker. Really? And so it's come down to me. And, and what did you actually do with shoes? I was a, I was a buyer. You bought them? Uh, yes, I yes, became yes. A, a buyer uh, of a rather large multiple firm in, um, in the Midlands and uh, became one of their directors. Did you? Mm. Right. Was that, uh, did you I sort of continue? I took all the ladies buying yes. and uh, all the colour combinations and uh, accessories. I did all that. Yeah. Did you stay in the shoe trade um, most of your life, Gordon? Oh, yes, or? I was in the shoe trade all my life. I, um, I, the business that uh, my work was, that it was, um, um, it became public, and then uh, I decided that I wanted my own business. I wanted to go into shoes on my own, and accessories, and um, I ended up uh, with a um, mini market, and um, that's where I um, really stayed, and I had... Uh, two or three altogether, mm -hmm. and uh, I built them up from nothing, sold them, and made a profit, and then bought another one, and from the from, yes. from nothing, yes. built it up, yes. and uh, then when I retired, I sold it, and um, that helped my niece and her husband who worked with me to be able to have uh, another business that we're still in today. Oh, lovely. Um, were you in the war? I mean, the army or? Yes, I was called up when I was 20 <laughs> and uh, I remained in um, in the army until for, for, nearly, for just over six years. I'm trying to. 39 and came out in 1945. And did you have psychic experiences in the army? I had many psychic experiences and um, I always feel um, that I. I don't say one enjoys the army, I don't think one enjoys a war, but I do think that it was the actual making of myself. I think that I learned more in those six years than I could possibly have learned in a lifetime of, of being a medium, just seeing only one side of life. Um, and I think that in that, and what I've been very happy about is that many of the people that have met me in the forces and uh, that uh, have never been spiritualist, who have became spiritualists, mm -hmm. and also that many of them founded other churches, in yeah. fact, two in Australia. Good Lord. Mm. Did you know any of the people in the um, Union in, the, in your time in the forces? Um, I knew that there were... I had many friends. Uh, I think mediums, um, and I, I hope that I, I, I'm a sort of person that people like. I hope so. I we all are have enemies. Yeah. We all find people that don't like us for one reason or another. But I found that I had very few enemies and, um, in the, the army. In fact, I think that I had uh, many, many friends. Many of them, I think, had come became my friends because uh, I think they respected me. I think uh, I hope that I uh, gave that of which they could respect. Um, 
Anyway, it was known that I was a spiritualist because I fought um, my case to have my religion on my um, badges, you know, the, the identity. Tell me about that. that we had. Well, um, it was a period of when um, uh, I went into the forces, and of course, spiritualism was really not recognized in a way. I mean, we were recognized to ourselves, but we weren't recognized nationally. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, I asked, when they asked me about my religion, I said I was a spiritualist and said there was no such religion, and that I had to be either Wesleyan, Baptist, um, uh, non conformist to what it is, Congregationist, and uh, mm -hmm. Church of England, Roman Catholic. And I said, Well, I'm sorry, but I'm none of those. I am a spiritualist. And of course, it kept going back and forward, and I had to meet the chaplain and uh, the padre, and I had to go before the colonel because I refused to wear my bag, my discs, which we had to wear on yes, our day, yes. uh, with our rank, our number, and uh, rank number, and uh, religion, uh, and the, the, the name there. And I refused because my religion was not on, and. Uh, in the end, they decided that I could have spiritism, and I refused that. And said, uh, spiritism said it's too long a name. So I said, well, I don't mind my name being smaller and everything else, but I do want the word spiritualist put on, which they eventually gave to me. Oh, so I was a spiritualist. Yeah. But I'm very pleased to say that at that same time, Billy Redmond, who was a very great medium, had done precisely the same as I had done. Really? And he was recognized as spiritualist. And that was the many of us of that age group uh, who were spiritualists stood, stood our ground and, you know, pestered mm -hmm. the authorities to give us that right. Yes. And I think we did bring about a different change, probably in a small way, but at least... We, because they realized we were not going to take... Yeah. And you were going across the river now. I've got to take you yes, back to that this, story. <laughs> there are many stories, but yes. this one is probably... I know, it sticks in my mind. Because yes. um, it was the story of when I... Um, we were in Italy, and it was a very bad uh, winter when we were there. And they had torrential rain. Uh, in their winter months. And the river, which I'm certain was called the Ronda, the Ronda, uh, was overflowed its banks. We'd got to get across to the other side because we were going to move forward in one main attack. And there was a bridge that was partially um, um, left, partially together. And uh, we got across it. But in the meantime, while we were across there, uh, our Germans were over there with their tiger tanks in very mighty force. There were only two companies of us that went across. And in the meantime, the range of the bridge, which was a wooden one, had gone, it had collapsed. So there was no bridge left. So we couldn't get back. So we were stuck there. And um, it was very fast flowing, it was a very wide river. And um, so um, we, we were waiting, really, for the Germans, which, who did surround us with their tiger tanks, etc., uh, to come in, and uh, uh, we would have been taken prisoner. Now, the idea was that we were given the orders that you fight to the last man, to the last round. And uh, I said, don't suppose we were very happy about that, but that was the rule, and that was the order of the day. Anyway, the company commander that was there, there were two company commanders, sent for me and said, um, Higginson, um, do you think you're going to die tonight? And I said, uh, no, sir. And he said, do you think uh, if you made a run for it to get out of these two farmhouses, these farmhouses, you could do it? And I said, uh, yes, I do. And uh, so he said, if there are any men that would like to go with you, and break out, that by all means do. And uh, so um, I said, right, well, I had a friend of mine who'd been shot in the arm. It wasn't, um, no bone broken with it, it was a flesh wound, 
but nevertheless it had to be dressed and uh, he needed to have it seen to. And I said, um, I, I know he will come with me. And so we ran to the bank of the river. Well, everybody knew uh, that I was supposed to lead them across. Um, not only because uh, I had the rank to, to take the leadership and I'd been told that they were to follow me, but also that um, uh, they knew that I was a medium as well and uh, they'd heard so much of the various things that had happened that I suppose they thought that, you know, was that the other. Nevertheless, um, I got to the river bank and it was at that point of when I thought, no, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I'm not a powerful swimmer. And uh, I didn't quite know how I could see this fast river and really be strong enough to be able to fight it to get across because you were fighting the mm, Russian yeah. soldiers. But anyway, uh, they were looking to me to take the lead, as usual, which they would do. And so I sent my thoughts to a control of mine. And um, she um, would be with me all my life. She uh, She named Cuckoo, actually. And uh, she called that name because uh, she used to peep in my bedroom and I used to shout Cuckoo, you see. And so, uh, which we used to do, Cuckoo. That's right. Yeah. And uh, she did that and uh, that became her name. And she accepted that name. And so I called her, and here she, she arrived, and uh, smiled at me as must say, you don't, you can't do anything without me, and uh, which was right. And uh, the, 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 um, we have a, a, in common um, a sort of ball which we, which she always shows to me. And when I'm working, and I'm probably working in a very large hall, mm. I very often see this kind of ball come, which tells me more or less the direction of where they want me to be. Yes. And this happened. Okay. It went bouncing onto the water, and I realized she was telling me to walk that way. Yes. So I did. And of course, I thought I was going to not feel the bottom and that sort of thing, and I was going to be helped. And of course, it was terribly cold, it was awful. And so I went down, and gradually I felt something under my foot, which was like ground hard. And I told everybody else to follow me. And I followed this ball, and it just came on the top of the river. And there, and kept coming back, it was like tacking, like you see these yes. uh, boats, these mm -hmm. uh, sailing yes. things tack. Um, that was what it was like. And I was going along and following this ball, and we got across to the other side. Oh, and when we got across to the other side, my friend, uh, in fact, a lot of them have been niggling and saying, what's he doing? Is what he's doing? And, and uh, because I was retracing and going right up the river and sometimes down the river, you see here, following this ball. And so when we got across to the other side, my friend said, how did that happen? What did you do? What were you doing? You seemed to be all over the place. And so I just happened to sort of say, I was following a bouncing ball, just covering my mouth so he could hardly hear. And he said, what did you say? So I said, I was following a bouncing ball. And he says, oh, good God, I'm glad you didn't tell me that, because I'm sure I'd have gone under. <laughs> now, the point was that it was a great experience. And there is... In the potters today, a young man that was in there. Really? Yes. And he, his wife is a Jehovah's Witness. And she was one day calling the spiritualist for everything. And uh, she happens to be working with a friend of mine that's uh, a vice president in our church. And uh, he went, she went home and said to us, these spiritualists, they're a damn nuisance. And that Gordon Higginson is no better than all the others. And he said, don't you ever dare to say anything about spiritualism to me. And she had no idea that her husband had known me. He yeah. never mentioned yeah. it. And he told her this story. And he said, I was there. Yeah. I saw this. Yeah. Don't you ever mention anything against Gordon Higgins? Because I was there and I had that experience. That's wonderful. 
So yeah. I think it brought a lot of people into it. When did your uh, physical mediumship first manifest, Gordon? I suppose it manifested then. Mm -hmm. But it also had manifested before, but I never tried to develop it. Because I do think that it's difficult to be a traveling medium, mm -hmm. doing ordinary mediumistic work, which we do, plus physical work. Mm -hmm. when did and you I sat for it only because I was told that I had these powers. Mm -hmm. I sat and developed it. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure it was my best work, um, because I couldn't give... The, the time to it, nor was I what I call physically and mentally strong enough to do it professionally. No. So I never ever did it professionally. I kept my work up for 25 years, my circle. And that was in Longton, was Longton. it? Yes. 25 years I had that circle. And um, I kept it rigid and we invited people from all over the country who used to come and sit with us, um, free of charge, there was no yes, money yes. involved, and uh, developed it to, to a good thing. And then, unfortunately, I did have um, a sort of an illness where I, um, I had a blood disorder, and um, uh, there was always that fear. And I also um, had... Um, was very near to diabetes yes. I was yeah. getting sugar yes. in my water yes. quite a lot and uh, I was told to go on to, well unfortunately in physical mediumship uh, you use enormous amount of energy and That's sugar right. yes. and I felt that uh, I had to ease it out yeah. so I really cut it down to doing only very few Seances until now, I only do about two or three. Yeah. Your circle in Longton, uh, what year did that start? Oh dear, it must have started, I would think, when I was about um, 29. Mm -hmm. was yes. I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I know it would be about yeah. that time. And it was once a week, was it? Once a week. Once a week. Yes. For 25 years? 25 years. Holidays? Or never a holiday. Never. Whenever we went on holiday, we always sat anyway. All really? our people sat. Yes. So we never, we'd never leave the circle. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd always sort of keep that time open. Yes. And wherever yeah. we were, we you leave sat that at that together. time. So that the circle only broke up for two weeks per mm -hmm. year, even through Christmas, Easter. We yes. never closed the yes. circle. I understand that um, at one point uh, at Longton you were getting materialisation that could actually walk the length of the road. Yes, they did actually. Uh, it was, again, I was thinking that it's a very wonderful mediumship. I only wish that I had, well, I won't say I wish it because I probably would have not wanted it like that. Yeah. If I have just been a, a physical medium only and I didn't do public work, I think I could have, you know, done enormous amount more work on that level. But I was in, I don't mean this in any big headed way, but uh, in my public work, I've always been in demand. Oh, yeah. And I've always been able to get any bookings I wanted. I've never, ever, throughout my life, ever been able to ask, ever ask for a booking. No. In fact, I really wish people hadn't asked me to give bookings. <laughs> Because I've always said yes when really yeah, I you ought to be saying with a bit of no, yes. And you can yeah. do it too often. But it is a, a, a point that um, uh, in physical mediumship, you've got to devote everything to it. Mm. And you cannot, you cannot abuse it. Yeah. And you see, once you are, the demand on you is so tremendous that people offer you the world. And people were writing and offering as much as a hundred pounds just to sit. Really? Oh yes. In fact, on one occasion, a gentleman invited me to his home and said, "If I would take a seance for five of his friends, he was prepared to give me a thousand pounds just for one seance." And did you? No. I gave them a seance, but, but you didn't uh, on my terms and. Uh, uh, with no money involved. That's wonderful. Because I felt once I tasted <coughs> that yes, type of money, yes. 
it would be very difficult for me uh, to, it was a temptation. Yeah. And I was nervous that I might go that way. Yes. Knowing that I do probably like to feel that I can buy nice things, I like a nice home, and I like to wear reasonable clothes. And I think really, normally you can't buy those things. So if you find yourself with one month of car, and you can find it easier to get what you want by doing it like that, then the ordinary people never have a chance. And I think it should be known that there is no medium that I know, and I try to read as much of it as I can, that has ever taken seances as big as I've taken. Yeah. I mean, when you come to think that I've taken seances for 300 people, Really? At Where a time that? in uh, Glasgow, really? 300 people were present. Whereabouts was that in this Glasgow? This was in Glasgow Association. Mm -hmm. It was packed. Yes. And I gave a seance of probably one of the best I've ever taken. And that was physical? Three on, yes. All materialization. Really? Was and um, the, it was packed yeah. with people. Was it blacked out or oh, did yes, you do everything it? Everything was done quite yes. correctly. Yes. They had wonderful yes. results. 300 people is a lot of people. That's an awesome yeah. thing. And um, I mean, here we've <coughs> never had less than 90. Yeah. I mean, on one occasion we've had over 100. Yes. You've, tri you've tried to find me anywhere yeah. where anyone's ever been mm -hmm. one of 100 mm -hmm. people to witness. Yes. You may not have had the results that they have in small circles, but at least it's given a lot of people an opportunity. Well, I've actually seen and the demand um, see, work that way. The, so the demand is yes. so tremendous. Mm. And the medium's under terrific strains, mm. really, because you've got all those people with all their thoughts. Mm. Yes, and yes. physical yes. mediums have never had it easy. No. And, um, and so you get all that. And... Uh, I've had several bruises and burns yeah. while I've been working yeah. by people doing silly things. Yes. But I've still kept it up, and uh, I am coming to the end of it now because I'm much older. Yes. Well, um, can you tell me, uh, I know that you, uh, you first worked in public when you were 11 and then 14. Can you tell me a little bit more in more detail about that? Yes, I suppose that... Um, uh, I was trained very well with my mother being such an outstanding medium, which she was, and she was outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, she um, developed me. I sat in circles since I was about three years of age. Really? Mm -hmm. And I was sitting with, in a chair. Uh, I mean, I used to sit on cushions uh, in the beginning. Yes. Here to my mother, yes. and I would sit with my head uh, on her knee, and I used to go to sleep. You see. Yeah. And uh, on my mother's in front of my mother's knees, and um, then when I was five, I actually had my own chair and sat in the circle, and uh, that continued. And when I was, and I saw, and I uh, used to see things then. But when I was ten, I was actually demonstrating. Mm -hmm. In the circle, not on the platform. Yes, yes. And I sort of took her part in open circles and uh, sort of small demonstrations with my mother uh, there and until I was um, 12. And mm -hmm. when I was 12, I took my first public demonstration. Where was that? And uh, at Longton. Yes. And that was the demonstration before the public on the platform. That was my first. And that was on my 12th birthday. Oh, lovely. And my mother said, you'll now remember it all your life. And so I always have. And then I went from there. I wasn't allowed to have bookings for churches to book me. My mother used to take me with her. Yes. And uh, I used to be on the platform with her. And then gradually they used to book me. And my mother would go along with me. And then gradually she would put me with other mediums. Uh -huh. And so when I was about 14, 15, I was giving the demonstrations of the Sunday services when there was a, someone there speaking. Yes. So I yes. brought in 
but my mother, and then when I was... Was 15, it like in local areas? All or? local areas. Yes. But when I was 15, 16, and then I was moving out. I mean, I'd been to, uh, up to Newcastle mm-hmm. on time. Uh, I'd done Liverpool. I'd been to Manchester. Yes. Uh, all over those sort of places. Uh-huh. And when I was 16, I was really in some of the largest halls in Great Britain. Really? 16. Uh, Did you I, work London at all? Yes. Uh, I, I didn't go to London uh, to um, take large meetings until after the war. Uh-huh. And um, I went to take my first meeting in what I call London, which was Croydon, in uh, Croydon Church that I went to. That was my first really? uh, meeting there. And um, that was uh, at Croydon at Bedford Park, which was before they went to the building where they are now. And I think that was in 1947, 48. And that was my first meeting. And then I took another one, and then I went to the uh, uh, Mary LeBone and demonstrated at the King's, uh, at the um, Victoria Hall, uh, on the Sunday when Harold Vargas was speaking, that I demonstrated with Sean Desmond, I demonstrated with Nan McKenzie, and... Um, and these were very large audiences. Oh, very large like audiences. They... Well, the hall was always packed. How and many it did it hold? Hall. 500? Oh, all over that, yes, about six or 700. Really? Yes. Every Sunday. Yes. This one. yes. And then I was booked for the May conventions in London, mm-hmm. and I think I can say that I was the medium that was invited for five consecutive years at the Kingsway Hall for the May Convention of the Sunday Evening Service, which was something that no one else had ever done. And when you say the May Convention, that was a spiritualist convention? Yes, yes, for all the London churches. Oh, I see. And yes. they always yes. held it at the Kingsway Hall, yes. which holds 2,000. Really? And the hall was always packed. It's an absolutely amazing career, mm. isn't it? And I suppose, really, that from uh, the point that is interesting, I suppose, looking back, I am perhaps today the only person left that's demonstrated with some of the greatest mediums that we've had. And except for Billy Redmond, uh, who is alive today, uh, who works a little, whereas I'm working a lot. No, I think and I suppose, really, when you look no. back, if I was demonstrating really from when I was 10, yes. then, quite honestly, it's a good many years. No. And I suppose that I'm the only one that's left today that probably has demonstrated in all the largest halls in Great Britain. Yeah. And I don't remember um, ever having a hall that wasn't packed. Well, I, I, I've never seen you work to anything less than mm-hmm. full capacity. Um, people waiting to get in outside. Can you tell me what any, you know, sort of main worries have been in your life, uh, Gordon? You know, what sort of real problems, you know, that you've, um, you feel that you've had to overcome? I suppose, uh, really, prejudice, jealousy to the extreme. I think that we have, which is unfortunate and spiritual, some very unkind mm. and very unpleasant people. Yes, yes. And which is sad. It is and although sad. they're a few, and only a few, they cause more harm. Yes. Because yes. they can be treacherous. Yes. And I suppose I, like other mediums, have had the treachery of people. Yeah. And... Um, which sometimes, had I not, I mean, one must bear in mind, this has never been my living. Yes, yes. And therefore, if it hadn't been for my dedication to it, 
I could have done much better if I hadn't have been in it. I could have made far more money. And um, I could have uh, traveled the world, had some yes. world asked me to go. Yes. But I put all my trust in the union and my trust in the churches. And that's where my work lies. That's wonderful. And uh, I think that it's that that to me is important. And I think you have to overcome these people who can be so unkind and um, create lots of problems for you um, and very hurtful. But I don't believe that anyone could have been the president of the union as a medium, which I was, mm. unless you had all this anxiety to get over first because you couldn't have taken the, all the knocks that you have to take. What do you visualise the future role of the Union? I think, first of all, that the Union has perhaps the most important role to make in the history of any religious movement. Because we're beginning to change uh, the con I'm not saying conscious. You see, boundaries of nations are falling apart. That's right. And such as the United States and uh, uh, Europe, uh, the European community, which is, I think, a, a wonderful community, the European community is going to grow. And it's got to do. Mm. Now, Besides coming together because of the economical situation that faces us and where we cannot isolate ourselves, and certainly Britain cannot and must never do that, we are not intended to isolate ourselves. We've got to be part of the whole. So to move into um, Europe as we did was absolutely right because no one can not work on their own. We've got to be with everything else. And you find the union will have a part to must play. depend on the other, so that the world will depend on each other. Mm. Now, that sort of system that's uh, coming about is, but we've got, which we are here now, when you come to think that in this country, the people from abroad and the people that have their own faith We've got to be able to find a movement that can link them all together. Yes. Now, the Hindus cannot bring the Christians into their movement, and the Christians can't bring the Hindus. Yes, yeah. Now, there's a very large Jewish um, community. Mm -hmm. Now, we find in spiritualism that there is a need for us by every faith. And we can provide it. Mm, mm. Therefore, the idea of the, the spiritualists, um, uh, you, and which I can see um, that the centenary that we are coming up to was um, inspired mm, absolutely. Uh, by the spirit world because we're the only group, the religion, who can unite every other religion together. So that's why we don't need all these things that, in actual fact, belong to the past. We must be a movement that's for the future. Yes. And yes. we've got to consider not only the Christians, but the Hindus, mm -hmm. the Jews, Islam. the Buddhists, the, 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 the Muslims. You see, there are 11 world religions that are living today. Yes. Now, spiritualism is, in, is meant to bring them together into a unifying thing where there is one thing that all will be able to accept. And that is, we've got to bring home the continuity of life unto death. And that God is within. Yes and that God is the God of each person. We sing that hymn, God of the granite and the rose, soul of the spell and the bee. 
what we need to, to also say is that whoever we are, whatever color, whatever caste, whatever creed, the same God is the Father of all. We all come in this world the same way, but go out of it the same way. And we move on the same way. That's marvelous.